in Genesis chapter 17 and we are working our way through all the way down to well we'll look at verse 12 through 14 and we'll look at um, <clears throat> this covenant of circumcision a little more and um, try to see Christ in it uh, a little more and try to see the cross in it, which is definitely a factor. Um, and in so doing, find the fulfillment of circumcision and how that fulfillment uh, should be impacting our lives. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So, begin with verse 12. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger which is not of thy seed. He that is born of the, um, he that is born of the house and he that is bought with money uh, must needs be circumcised. And my covenant is shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant, for an everlasting, which sort of makes it sound like this thing goes on forever beyond just our lifetime, beyond our 80 years or 70 years or however long we live, <clears throat> um, maintaining this covenant. Um, Verse 14, and the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. Okay, so we've, we're, we're familiar with the first part. We're familiar. We've gone over those to a certain degree. But there's this last little part here that talks about those who are not circumcised uh, and the uncircumcised man child whose flesh of the foreskin is not circumcised that soul shall be cut off from his people he hath broken my covenant um, I'm assuming and I'm pretty sure this would be correct but I'm assuming that um, this is a reference here in verse 14 not to someone who's a stranger because you know, uh, God spoke to Abraham here in the previous verses and specifically said, don't circumcise them. <clears throat> the ones that are of your house, the ones that are of the family, they should be circumcised. Okay. But he says in the uncircumcised child whose flesh. Okay. So, so this sounds like this must be uh, because the end result of it is, is um, from he'll be cut off from his people, he hath broken my covenant. Uh, so this sounds like somebody that's in the family, somebody that belongs to God, somebody that is um, supposedly following the Lord of the family. Um, and... Um, so, uh, so to, to, to sort of move this along towards the Lord, I, I wrote this statement. All males, uh, both of firstborn or family, are circumcised, but the lamb was cut off. The lamb was cut off. He became the flesh that was cut off. Now, you know, I'm sure, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that there are certain verses that are coming to you uh, that substantiate that statement. That Jesus was as if he were one of those who was cut off. Uh, and that took place at the cross. Uh, and the reason for that was that he became... The flesh that was cut off. Okay, so I wanted to just look at a couple of scriptures. 
um, as we do that. But um, when, when it refers back to Abraham and his time and his family or the Jews or whatever, um, to not be circumcised, and I don't know that, that this, you know, we were really aware of this, but to not be circumcised meant also that you could not become the firstborn. Well, the firstborn is Christ in us. The firstborn is a certain kind of nature. The firstborn is the son that the father chose and he put him in us. We say he chose to put him in us, but he chose the one that he put in us. And um, uh, so the, the, the children of Abraham, if you will, the family of Abraham or all the Jews, if they didn't get circumcised, there was no hope for the firstborn being in them, coming out of them, bringing glory to the Father, being all that the Father wanted, but wanted him in an earthen vessel. So then we're just left to be an, earthen, uh, an empty earthen vessel, uh, devoid of... You know, that's like a coffee cup that never gets used for coffee. Well, you know, then you're not a coffee cup. Don't call me a coffee cup, just call me a cup. Uh, well, it's shaped like one, and it's got this little handle and everything, and you could put coffee in there. Well, yeah, but it's not being used for its purpose, and that's the same kind of situation with... Uh, the, the circumcision and those who are circumcised as opposed to those who are not. Those who are n not circumcised are like that coffee cup that never gets used for coffee. But if you're circumcised, then that opens the door for the firstborn Christ in you as the firstborn, not just Christ in you as a Christian because I got saved and I asked Jesus to come in my heart. <clears throat> and now, you know, I have Christ in me, the hope of glory. It's not referring to that. You don't have the firstborn. You're not, you have not given the firstborn the ability to live the life that he wants to live. Okay, so a quick flashback <clears throat> to Exodus 12 again, where, you know, they were in Egypt and... God said, well, I'm going to destroy the firstborn, whether of man, man or animals or da-da-da-da, whether, whether Egypt or Israel. And the proof that he was, he was going to kill all firstborn was that, there had to, you know, was, was that they had to put blood, they had to put lamb's blood, they had to put slaughtered lamb proof on their doorpost or... Israel's firstborn would have died just as surely as Egypt's did. So this whole thing, if you remember, we went over it a lot. This whole thing was really about firstborns in more ways than one or two ways. It was majorly about God's heart to get his firstborn son. And um, so what we know is that the the blood didn't save everybody in the house. The blood saved the firstborn that was in the house. Okay? And, um, and so when it got, came time to go, to leave, um, the children of Israel that were not firstborns, they were just delivered because God brought them out with a mighty hand instead of with a slaughtered lamb and it says that all in the psalms in different places he brought them out with a mighty hand uh, but he brought the firstborn out with a slaughtered lamb and uh, so you could you could be in the family if you were of israel and not the firstborn you you were of the family and and god loved and protected you all the way through the wilderness even if you 
constantly did things contrary to the to the land that you ate and should have digested and manifest firstborn that's the firstborn that's Christ as the firstborn um, you know and we can say well you're saved and you're gonna make it to the promised land but they pretty much didn't make it to the promised land it was their next generation their kids uh, but the idea being God God was protector and keeper and everything and uh, and and he had to be that and he had to be understood as that because those who were not of the firstborn all they constantly asked for deliverance from this and from that and from this all the way through the wilderness that was their deal that was basically their whole deal that's the story of them in the wilderness but you have people like uh, Joshua and Caleb and others that were true firstborns and their approach was completely different you know it was completely completely different um, and so um, so that those words being said to, in uh, here in Genesis 17 being said uh, by God to Abraham that if there's anybody that's not circumcised they'll be cut off okay so that's that's someone who could have been a firstborn but the first step to Christ being formed in you as that firstborn that he is and we're not is circumcision there has to be the the cross the cross has to bring about or release the beginning of the further things that God wants to do not just save us to see the cross then if if Israel wandering in the wilderness had come upon an issue which they did but have they come across an issue where there was a cross and everything they would have said you know Lord let this cross just save us and keep our lives so that we don't die or you know get hurt or do without or whatever well there was the serpent on the pole and that you read John 3 in the New Testament and that serpent on the pole represented the cross and you know it was for people who just wanted uh, you know who had done things wrong uh, this then the serpents were loosed and then they wanted them to stop without there was no repentance there was no you know uh, there was no firstborn heart toward the father in them um, and so they missed the mark again and again okay so um, uh, it says now remember I said uh, well maybe I should see if I, I read this one of the things required to become the firstborn is circumcision there must be a manifestation of the covenant in our flesh and we kind of talked about that a couple of times uh, my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant and that's the verse just before the one that says but if you're not then you'll be cut off all right um, keeping your place in Genesis 17 but if you can and if you can't it's no big deal because I'm gonna read it to you anyway but if you want to turn there with me it's uh, next verse is Romans 15 verse 8 okay now now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers okay well when did that covenant to the fathers to whom and when did that covenant first begin Ta-da! Genesis 17. Genesis 17. This is a reference to the beginning with Genesis 17 and being carried out through Isaac and Jacob and so forth. But those 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 represent the fathers. By the way. They do. Abraham, Isaac, 
and Jacob represent the fathers. Okay, and um, well, there's so much I could go into about Joseph and, and showing that Joseph ultimately the seed didn't go through Joseph's line, but Ephraim and Manasseh. And when it's mentioned uh, throughout the Bible, when it talks about the fathers, it talks about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay. Uh, so um, this is the beginning of that and the introduction of it by God. And so Paul comes along and he says, now, I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. He's, he's saying this is just a confirmation of, and, and, and it, is the, it is the solid confirmation of it, of what God was trying to say all along to the fathers to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and therefore to those that were around them in the family and all of that. <clears throat> um, and, and so how, so let me try to word it like this. Let's, let's just say that the, the, these words I'm about to say represent this. Uh, a minister of the circumcision. <clears throat> let's say that it's saying that he was the one who administered circumcision or he was the one who brought it about in like Abraham did. I mean, bam, Abraham turned around and just did it and did it, you know. And then when Joshua did it and, you know, uh, they just, everybody just all at once. So, well, Jesus did it. But he did it by taking our flesh upon himself and going to the cross to put that flesh to death, to cut it off, to put it away, to remove it. <clears throat> not just the sins, the, not just the sins, plural, of what that flesh produced, because what's, what's the point of that? You just take away all the sins we've ever committed and then we live as Israel and not as firstborns anymore, not as the firstborn letting him live in us in a manner where we're just not running rampant. Um, so this is how Jesus did it. This is how he fulfilled the whole thing in a right spirit and understood it and understood the Father's heart and said, I'll do it. I'll take their flesh. I'll make sure that they die because I'll die. I'll take all of that flesh on me, in me. And you remember in the, in the Old Testament leading up to, to the Passover where Jesus died, um, they, uh, and, and through the years, um, in all of the feast and all of the, you know, times, they always would um, uh, kill a lamb. And then on that special feast, Day of Atonement, they, the, all the high priests, all the, they would lay their hands on that lamb and confess all of their sins on it and then go kill it. And they go, oh, this is great. This is our great plan. This is wonderful. We can sin, and then once a year, we just bring a lamb in here and put our sins on it and then kill it, and then we're free. Well, that's, that's pretty much the way most Christians view the death of Christ, just like the Jews. Well, we'll just sin all year, <laughs> and then maybe we don't take it a whole year. Who knows? I mean, maybe we take it, maybe it's every five years or 15 years for us that we even think to repent of, of anything. But, um, but uh, the, the whole thing was a mindset of, uh, of one that needed deliverance, of being just Israel and needing deliverance 
instead of the firstborn living in us and being in us. Now, you, you kind of get a picture of that with Isaac when, you know, God says, Take now thy son, thine only son, thy son whom thou lovest, and take him up unto a mountain that I will show thee, and offer him up as a burnt offering. And Abraham, by then, catches on to what a firstborn is. He, it takes him a long time. It may take us a long time. Takes, but he finally does it. And he just takes him right up there and pulls the knife up. And God said, okay, I was just checking to see if you really loved me, if you really feared me in, in the right way, respected me to such a degree that you would give your son just like I will give my son one day. Are you of this seed? Are you of this spirit? Are we truly together? Is there a true relationship, a real relationship between you and God? That's what that's what's being said. And that's what I mean, that's what I assume that he's saying to me. <clears throat> and is that relationship based on the covenant? Circumcision. Cutting off the flesh cutting off our flesh, except we can't and won't do it. Okay. All right. So there's more. But I mean, I, I love this. I love this, that he's a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, not just the word of God, meaning it says in the scripture that we should do this, so we will do it. We're, we're, uh, we're scriptural. We're not allowing the firstborn to live in us. We're scriptural. We're keeping a book. For God's sake, for his sake. But the lamb, the son, the firstborn, he doesn't do it for those reasons. He doesn't care about a book. He's not even trying to, uh, he's fulfilling the scriptures by just being of that spirit. That's the fulfilling Love fulfilleth all things, and by this perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us and took our flesh, and in so doing circumcised us, and now we should let the firstborn live in us and do that for one another. That's uh, real simple. It's 1 John 3.16. 1 John 3.16. Um, and this, and that's what having the covenant in your flesh is about. Okay. So um, let's let's go to Colossians chapter two, starting with verse ten. Um, <clears throat> Colossians two ten through thirteen, and you are complete in Him which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also you are circumcised, in whom also you are circumcised, in whom you are circumcised, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh. Okay. So we're trying to put off the sins of the flesh, either by, well, mainly by the blood of Jesus, which is, I don't know. I mean, this is just me. Don't go with this. It just feels weird to me that we're trying to put off the sins by the blood of Jesus when God was trying to put off the death of his firstborn by his own death, the lamb that was slain and killed and his blood put on there so that he would get more of the same. Not, not free will sinners, but um, lambs in the image of Christ. But, it's, but it is him. It is his image. It is his nature. Um, anyway, that's just a, it's always, I don't know always, but it's, it has bothered me for a while. You know, we use the blood strictly for getting rid of our sins when the original way that it was used had to do with the firstborn and to save the firstborn with not just the lamb's blood, but by eating that lamb and becoming 
like him and of him and in being and in uh, um, fullness, get full of that lamb, eat ye all of it, drink ye all of it. Fullness of that lamb being in us. Anyway, just a side note. Um, <clears throat> For you are complete in him, which is the head of all principalities and powers, in whom ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Now, a lot of times we somehow grasp the last part of that verse with the circumcision not made with hands. What an incredible statement in advance of that, in whom you are circumcised. Okay, that's your circumcision. That's the one that's going to end up being Maybe not when he died, but it will eventually be in your flesh, those who allow the firstborn to be formed in them. Therefore, they will be more than, uh, that, that will open the door for those in the family who all get circumcised to begin to gain the spirit of the family, the spirit of the firstborn, so that they too can manifest that same spirit. <clears throat> all right. And putting off the body of the sins of the flesh. Putting, this is how you put off the body of the sins of the flesh. You do it by the next, ver next words, by the circumcision of Christ. See, he took all of that body of sins and flesh of all of us. And he took it in himself and he went to the cross and he died, and he just didn't die for our sins. He died for our flesh, meaning he died to, to put away the flesh so that sins wouldn't be near the problem it is to most of Christianity today. You know, everything from standing up to our own rights to, you know, wanting, you know, wanting glory to, I mean, by taking on the firstborn, it voids out so much I can't even tell you by that, the way that he is compared to the way we are in our little schemings and plannings and workings and our, our little, little hands that we want to get hold of stuff with. All right. <clears throat> buried with him in baptism. Thank God. See, he didn't just put us to death, but he buried us so that the flesh would be put out of sight. Um wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, with, because based on all of what he just did, hath quickened you together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Okay, so this is, this is the minister, uh, a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, to make this thing really work um, so that it could be in our flesh. In our flesh, praise God, not just in our doctrines or in our theology or in our um, teachings, but he's a good minister of the circumcision to us for the truth of God. Thank God he did it for the truth of God instead of the ritual. Uh, 13, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Okay, so uh, if you really look at the whole thing, before he started talking about forgiving your trespasses, uh, which is verse 13, uh, in verse 11, he talked about being circumcised and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, the old nature, the old man, the old attitude, the old uh, way of, of doing things, um, the flesh, the religious flesh, if you will. May I say it that way? The religious flesh, uh, as well as all flesh, okay? So that in so doing, then he, he didn't see, he didn't just take away our sins first. He took away our, the flesh first and then our sins. We look at it like he took away our sins first. And then one day he's going to take away our flesh. Like as if the, if the rapture happens, 
you know, I'm going to be circumcised in the air and not even know what hit me or something weird, you know. I mean, while we may never think that specific thing, our thinking on this is weird, just as weird to God, if not weirder. <clears throat> All right. So, so that scripture says... Um, Uh, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. Okay? So, what this is saying to us is, you were cut off in him. Yep. You were cut off in him. You and I were the flesh. And we were joined to him First and foremost, not because he really likes sin and flesh and all the whole sin of the world and, oh, just join to me, I just love this. No, you, we were joined to him so that we could be cut off, so that he could fulfill the truth of, of, of God, so that it could really happen. And so, uh, in so doing, he... He cut us off that we might have a new life in Christ. Okay, well, you, you see that in uh, 2 Corinthians 5. What is it? It's, I don't know. I think it's, yeah, verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that are with the purpose of that, we might be made the righteousness of God, but only that in Him. Okay. Well, to be in Him is to receive of the life flow. Uh, I mean, if, you know, if I, if something happened to me when I was a kid and my arm got cut off, and then years later they found a way where they could get another organ, another arm, and attach that in there, that thing was cut off from somebody else. It's certainly not mine. What makes it mine? The stitches? No. The life flow that's already alive here in my body will flow into it, which is the vine branch principle, totally, will flow into it, and what was... Um, cut off, all of a sudden starts showing signs that there's, there's life in there. Coloration and movement and, you know, but it's flowing, it's flowing and doing all that. It's just the, the arm can say, I have life, I have life, I have life. And then, you know, you have to say, uh, no, I have life, I do. And my arm, you have my life. Okay? Well, we were cut off intentionally. Cut off. And Jesus did it for the truth of God. And so that this thing could be um, properly fulfilled instead of just the next generation after Abraham going, well, this is what we were taught to do, and let's do it, and then the next generation after. It's like, you know, an example I use a lot is if you have a really beautiful picture of something, and you say, oh, I, I want everybody to get a copy of this, but the only, you know, your copy won't make a whole bunch at one time. You have to put the original on there, make a copy, then take that copy and make a copy of the copy, and then take the copy of the copy and make a copy, and then you, you just continue to copy the copy that was before you, and they copied the copy that was before them, and once you get down the road, it's so pale you can't see, the, if that was a picture of Jesus' face, you can't see, you know, whose face is that? I don't know. I don't get it. But we've got this paper with faded whatever, and we've got it hung up, and we're supposed to go by this. Everybody's supposed to see this. All of us. Not, not Paul, not Randy, not certain people are supposed to see it. 
This is the truth of God. This is trying to confirm the promises that were made to the Father in us to be the true manifestation of what the Jews only had a shadow of. We're, we're it. Well, are we? Maybe, maybe in a certain sense, they were more faithful than we were, and at least they circumcised all the time, and we don't even circumcise in the spirit of what this is saying, in the method or whatever that this is saying. We just believe Jesus died for my sins. That's pretty much it. And Well, well, you got to add to that. And I'm going to go to heaven and not hell. And when I go to heaven, I'm going to be happy forever. Everything's going to be exactly what I want. Okay. So, um, but this is, this is not for us. This is uh, uh, a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God. This is for the truth of God so that he gets it exactly, not we're not us in heaven getting exact. This is what I, this is perfect, exactly for me, everything I love. This is heaven. <laughs> heaven is for you to get everything you want and love and makes you comfortable. Um, Okay. No, the truth of God is this is what God wants. This is, this is the very purpose that he came back to Abraham after 13 years of Ishmael and said, I am El Shaddai. I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect, meaning line up with what I desire. That's his version of perfection. But that's only fully done by Christ. But that's not done by Christ just magically. We are born again, and we pretty much think the way we did as a sinner, and we pretty much do a lot of the things still, even if we're born again. You don't just get born again and, man, I don't do anything wrong or think anything wrong anymore. I'm just perfect. No, it's a walk. But it's a walk with Him. And it's, a, it's, a, it's that being yoked together, learning of Him. I'm yoked with you, but if you're not yoked with Him, then then we miss it again. We've, we've missed the covenant. We've missed the covenantal relations that God had in his heart, not in his mind, not in his plan. Well, let's write up a plan here and, you know, got anything to add, Jesus or Holy Spirit? Well, maybe we should have them, you know, like meet every once a week or something. Good idea, you know. That's, that has nothing to do with God, our God. He had something in his heart. And by the determinate counsel of those three, they had Christ put to death so that it could fulfill the, the, the uh, confirm the promises that would be made or that had been made to the fathers for the truth of God, for the truth of God. So, let's see. Um, so just some, just some thoughts here, and I will try to keep it within 45 minutes if possible. <clears throat> uh, so why does everybody have to be circumcised, though? I mean, well, because that's the cross, and because nobody gets in some other way except thieves and robbers, and they don't get in. They just try or think that they're in. Okay, so the cross has to be first. If the cross isn't there, there's not, we're not going to have anything of, of the nature of God. We'll just try to copy it, like being a good Christian or something like that. All right, why not just circumcise the very firstborn son that comes along? Why not just say, you know, why, Lord, why don't you just say, Every time a family has a son, just circumcise him. 
We don't all need to be circumcised. Just circumcise here, you know. And uh, because it's not always the very first one in birth order. We know that. We've seen it in many of our stories that we've been dealing with this on. And it's not that. Uh, only God, only the Father knows the Son. And only the Son knows the Father in the way that He wants to be known. And we need to enter into that fellowship instead of trying to build our own apart from the Son and even apart from the Father. It's just, we try to build a relationship with God. I'm going to build a relationship with God and I'm going to be the Christian. Okay, so I have a relationship with God. Well, what's the point of the firstborn then? Just have a relationship with, with the, the Supreme Being? You know, I believe there's a God. Well, I think that was addressed in the Bible. So does the devil, and he trembles. At least, at least he trembles over it, knowing that there's a God. All right. So, uh, so obviously, um, if Abraham had of uh, circumcised only the firstborn, that would have been the firstborn in birth order. That would have been Ishmael, and that would have been wrong. Okay, and. He was trying to anoint, you know, everything from Lot to Eliezer to Ishmael to, you know, everything but the right son. He had no concept of the correct son that was a, the son of the father's heart. God, God is just bringing him through all this stuff. The whole story there um, is God's working to get the son revealed so that Abraham would understand what this was all about. So I wrote down, we will anoint the first one who fits our expectations, see. And everybody's got different expectations and ideas. And, and most of those expectations and ideas relate to us. They come back to us. So, you know, uh, you know this, this person over here, is very gentle and everything, and we say, oh, they must be it. You know? And this one over here is very strong and firm, and we say, oh, and someone else says, oh, man, that must be it. We don't know. We don't know. We really don't. I mean, if we had just had really admit that, I know we've, we've prayed it, Lord, I don't know, but we constantly make decisions or make assumptions based on what we, what we don't know and have no clue what he's really like at that stage. Uh, <clears throat> Therefore, God has it where every male child in the family is circumcised. Okay, so that's a good idea. Just circumcise everybody in the family, and when there's one that comes along and by free will says, I want the son, I want the firstborn to live in me. I don't want to live as Israel. I don't want to live as one who's always just wanting deliverance from all of my problems and all of the world problems and all of the, you know, I want him. Then, then, see, then the father can go, whoop, ah, there he is. He's going to get my firstborn son according to the truth of God, which will confirm the covenants to the fathers, the circumcision covenant. All right. Um, and then I put one way to tell, one way to tell if the firstborn is in us is not by any religious thing that we do. It's not by uh, any position we hold. It's not by how much we've learned. It's not by all of the religious things, how often we're in church or our place and all of that. Um, there's only one way to tell. If we are always seeking deliverance for the things we should be laying down our lives over. If we're always, Lord, give me that. Lord, help me with this. Lord, get, deliver me from this. You know, you say, well, don't I need to clear that out before Jesus will? We should have learned that when the first time we went out to, to preach, to 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 witness, to 
try to win somebody to the Lord. You don't say, okay, now you, you get right and get perfect and everything, come back and then I'll lead you in salvation. Then you'll be ready. You don't do that in this case either. You know, you come to him, you seek him, you desire him. And, you know, you can desire him over stuff that's wrong with you, but I think there's a more excellent way. I think you just love him and you begin to, to say, I just want you, I, you know, I, I could care less if you fix this. I just, if you could just fill me with your life and your mind and everything, that Father, you would get your son out of this earthen vessel instead of a whiny wham wham that's always wanting your help over my first birth life instead of my new birth into Christ. That's probably enough right there. That's probably enough. Let's pray. Father, we just uh, thank you so much that <clears throat> you did all of this without our permission. You did all of this without our understanding. <clears throat> you did it before we were born. You did it in relationship to your son before there was a world or a problem or a devil or a sin or us. <clears throat> that was your desire. That was your heart. And you were willing to have him take care of all of the sin problem by being cut off instead of cutting us off. You made him the flesh and you cut him off. The Father in the spirit in which he did it, in the selfless depths that you saw, you raised that one from the dead, from among the dead, so that there would be that one, so that there would be that one that could be formed in each one that would go beyond just the cross saving us from Egypt, but would want your firstborn to be in us too, for the truth of God, for your truth, in us and your confirmation in us by your firstborn son. We ask you to keep pouring forth. We ask you to keep pouring your heart into us. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.